Okay, so we designed our primers, and now we've received them, and we're ready to validate them. And I would validate any primers that you received. So, so primers that are given to you by a colleague, primers that are sent to you, primers that, that you found in the literature, any primer pair should be validated experimentally before you run it with real samples. And the, the two validation steps that you can do with primers to assure that they're good primers is a gradient qPCR to optimize your annealer temperature. Uh, so it's a thermal gradient in qPCR. And then the second is a standard curve, which should be done with every new primer pair you get. So if we look at a thermal gradient qPCR, this is the results that we would get. And you can see that on all biolab instruments, actually, um, the plate, uh, in one experiment, you can divide the plate into different temperatures going across each row. So each row becomes a different annealing temperature on, the, on that plate. That's how the thermal block can be set up. If you look at A and B here, there is no qPCR curve whatsoever. And A and B, where the annealing temperatures were probably just too high. For, for, those, uh, for those primers to bind. C gave us a value uh, for the CP values, a CP value of 30, between 36 and 38, let's say. But that's a very high CP value. I recommend that you look for a, a working range of CPs in a qPCR experiment between about 10 and 36 CPs. So this is very high in C and very poor reproducibility between the two replicates that were run. And that's because, the, again, the temperature was just too high. Those primers were not binding efficiently. If we look at D, it's, it's down at 22 CT. So within a working range, still a bit of separation between the replicates, but still right shifted significantly from all the other curves, as you can see, meaning that D is probably still not optimal in terms of its annealing temperature, still right shifted from, in terms of CP values from all the other curves. All the rest of the curves overlap perfectly at about 21 CTs meaning that this range of temperature here, 54 to about 60 degrees, can be used with this primer pair for, for, uh, in, in, uh, with this sample, whatever sample that you were running to validate your primers. And, and the sample that I recommend for, for doing validation of primers is just any sample sample that you have. It needs to be a sample in, from which you've extracted RNA and done the reverse transcription. Uh, where you've tested the RNA for purity and quality, which you should do for all the samples anyway. So in a thermal gradient qPCR experiment, we're testing for the optimal annealing range of temperatures. And in this case, for this primer pair, we can see that the optimal range is from 54 to 59. Now, what I would do also in this experiment is run a melt curve analysis <coughs> to assure that you get a single peak per primer pair, meaning specificity. So you want to assure that in that range of temperatures where you have the most left shifted CTs, you still have one nice single peak in terms of the melt curve. And if you have one nice peak, then you know you have very specific um, primers, which is what you're looking for. Also, even if you have one nice peak at all the temperatures, take at least one sample from from, uh, from any one of the wells that has a single peak in it and run that on the gel to assure that you have an appropriate molecular weight for each gene of interest that you're running. The reason why I would recommend doing that is only to assure that you haven't specifically amplified a non-specific product. So by having both the molecular weight and the milk curve data, you've assured specificity of your primers and you've also assured that you're targeting the right size of amplicon. Once we've done that first gradient qPCR experiment, then we can go and do our um, standard curve. And so we should do the gradient qPCR with all the primers that you're going to study in a particular experiment. So you get all the, the optimal ranges of temperatures for working with your primers and pick a temperature that is common in the range of all the amplicons. So if all the amplicons have a, have, a, have a temperature of, let's say, 59 degrees, that's within the range of, any, of optimal annealing temperatures for all of the primers, then that's the temperature that I would use for my actual experiment that I'm going to run with my real samples.
a 59 degree annealing temperature because I know all my primers are optimal uh, for their um, for their um, uh, annealing at that temperature. So then I'll do a standard curve with all my primers. And the standard curve is nothing more than a dilution series. Again, I have an actual extracted sample uh, that we've used. Uh, could be the same sample that you used for your gradient PCR, actually. So you dilute that sample in a dilution series. I recommend initially a tenfold dilution series. You can use fivefold or threefold. Or, you know, it has to be a, a serial dilution series um, across. I recommend at least eight data points, with each point in triplicate. And this is what good reproducibility looks like of your technical replicates at each data point, nicely overlapping curves, as you can see. And on the right, we have very poor replicates, as you can see here. And this is not. Uh, uncommon in the qPCR community for people who are just starting. Uh, really, qPCR separates the the, uh, the good pipetters from the poor pipetters. So you learn how to pipette very well when you do qPCR experiments. To get good reproducibility, it does require good reagents, and I've seen poor reproducible reproducible data. Particularly with people who make their own, uh, who make their own uh, tack and who make their own uh, mixes with cyber green and tack and nucleotides and so on, because <coughs> there is very um, little thought into the rigor that's required to assure that each batch of supermix is the same as the batch before with standard testing, because that will definitely have an effect on your CT values. Um, within within experiments and between replicate plates and experiments. So, um, and, and I do recommend actually a reagent which we just launched this year from BioRub called SoFast, Evergreen Supermix. What's really great about this mix actually is that the TAC is chimerized to the SSO7B protein, making this chimer molecule very, very specific for cDNA and very strongly binding. So it's much more resistant to potential inhibitors of TAC that could be co-purified when you purify your RNA and do your reverse transcription to convert to cDNA, um, which can cause a lot of biological variability between samples. So this, this particular enzyme is very nice for, for assuring better reproducibility, particularly in samples that may have more or less contaminants uh, between replicates. Um, they, um, contaminants that would inhibit the TAC, which is common um, in, in uh, extractions. The other nice component in this reagent, besides the chimerized TAC, is uh, the evergreen. So evergreen is a saturating dye. It, it, it uh, excites and fluoresces in the exact same way as cybergreen, but it doesn't inhibit TAC, um, which cybergreen does. So any cybergreen mix it's carefully balanced to assure that there's a too much cyber green that it fully inhibits the attack, but enough cyber green to get a decent enough signal. With evergreen, you don't worry about that. It's not attacking inhibitors, so you can use much more evergreen, which allows the double-stranded uh, amplicons to be much more populated, and in fact saturated, with the evergreen molecule, um, allowing many more fluorescent molecules of evergreen per amplicon than with cyber green hence increasing the sensitivity of your assay as well. So sensitivity is increased, and reproducibility is increased as well with this, with this mix, which is very uh, uh, similar, actually, in price to standard cyber gray mixes. So I do recommend this as a, as a very good uh, alternative to the traditional cyber gray mixes that are out there. And of course, as with all of our uh, super mixes uh, from BioLab, it's antibody um, inhibited, so it's a hot start pack which allows you to work with it um, uh, at your bench um, to, to prepare your samples.